Christianity of the cross or the Christianity of the crutch? What shall we have? A warm and affectionate welcome to all young people to this most elementary but radical reflection on what should be the nature of the Christianity that we practice. Or, to put it differently, what is the true nature of the spiritual vision that Jesus Christ has brought to us? What is the meaning of the cross? And we are undertaking this very simple reflection almost on the threshold of the Holy Week of 2024. In a few days from now, throughout the world, people will come together to reflect or meditate on the meaning of the crucifixion of Christ, the meaning of the cross, when the seven words that Jesus uttered from the cross will be meditated upon. But in doing this, I'm pretty sure that the content or the substance of what we share through this video will be neglected. And that's the reason why I thought it would be appropriate to uh, mark this important and inalienable uh, aspect of the biblical faith through this very simple video. Now, I phrased it somewhat provocatively as the, the Christianity of the cross or the Christianity of the crutch what is it that you want? I have to say, based on my somewhat extensive experience in Christendom, both in India and in several other countries, over a period of at least four, four, four decades, 40 years, that what is prevalent, what is current in the contemporary world is crutch Christianity, not cross Christianity. To understand this, let us uh, for a moment engage with the crutch as a symbol. Crutch as a symbol. Now when a man's leg is amputated or is seriously damaged or is seriously deformed, shall we say on account of a disease like polio, uh, the polio deformation, um, then that person moves with the aid of a pair of crutches. Now, on the face of it, it would so seem that that person is really uh, privileged and fortunate to have a pair of crutches. Otherwise, he would have been uh, completely immobilized. He would have stayed confined to his room or his bed or whatever. Now he is at least able to move about in the open space. His movements are not free, fluid, or beautiful. They are hampered, they are heavy. But his, his movement is, is capable of moving about, uh, though not in the natural way. So to that extent, for an amputee, it's a great blessing. It's a great help to have a pair of crutches. So if you reflect on what is needed from the condition and from the perspective of an amputee, then you will realize, and then you would come to the conclusion that the most important thing to have, or the greatest blessing to have, is a pair of crutches. I have to submit to you, my young friends, that religions in the world are organized in this manner. This is the reason why in all religious traditions there is an awareness that there is a fundamental problem in the human condition. In the Buddhist, Buddhist tradition, for example, <coughs> There is this doctrine of Dukkha, that is, we are living in a world of suffering and that suffering denotes a serious problem in the human condition in this world and therefore there is a need to liberate human beings from this sea of suffering, from Dukkha. In the Hindu perception also, there is this idea that when everything existed in their primal unity as Brahma, there was no problem, but creation meant 
that whatever existed, the substance that existed in its primal unity as Brahma, got dispersed, giving birth to diversity, plurality and plenitude. And the moment diversity and plenitude came into being, conflict arose and suffering was generated. And therefore, what you see in this world is, a, uh, is nothing but a shadow play of illusions, Maya, the doctrine of Maya. The world is unreal. The world is not unreal in the sense that, you know, there is no object that you cannot, there is no object that you can touch, or there is no person you can interact with. That's not the sen in sense in which the world is deemed Maya, or unreal, or illusory, or untruthful by uh, the Hindu spiritual thinker. It is in the sense that the true nature of everything got distorted in the process of uh, the substance of the primal unity being dispersed in order to, in order for the uh, world of diversity to come into being. Therefore, the true nature of all that you see, the phenomenal world, can be attained only when the phenomenal world returns to the primal unity. And in the Christian tradition, that is Judeo-Christian tradition, there is this idea of the original fall, which underlines the fact that the order that created, that God created in the beginning was a perfect order. And human beings, uh, by their act of willful disobedience to God, introduced or injected imperfection into the system, creating a world of suffering, uh, which then necessitates divine intervention in order to rectify and redeem this error. And this error tormented human condition in this world. That's the doctrine of salvation. Uh, so on and so forth. So the, the, the recognition that there is a problem. Now that problem is understood in the religious context, uh, almost analogous to the predicament of an amputee. Uh, there's something wrong with the amputee in the sense that he who or she who should have had a pair of legs now has only one leg. And therefore, that problem needs to be solved. How is that problem to be solved? The resources of the world for all the progress that science and technology has achieved, we are in no position to cause the amputated leg to grow again back into the original shape and size. All that we can do is to provide a poor, lifeless, pathetic substitute for the limb that was lost. But for an amputee who does not entertain the hope or ambition of being able to grow back uh, the lost limb, this is a great asset to which he clings. Now, this is the sense in which people hold on to their religion. Not that any religion will ever cause your amputated limb, metaphorically speaking, to grow back and lead you back to the original no sense of normalcy. Normalcy as it existed originally. For that, some other solution is required. And that solution was what Jesus <coughs> introduced as the kingdom of God, which is radically different from the idea of religion. Unfortunately, <coughs> the great tragedy, the great act of vandalism, destruction that was effected in, in Christendom was to deform and uh, destroy the idea of the kingdom of God and to make it synonymous with Christianity as an organized religion, which I have to tell you uh, in a state of informed conviction is no different from any other religion, though there is no end to the Christian claim that we are far superior to everybody else. In fact, we are the only genuine people in the world. And so long as you conform to the dictates and prescriptions of Christianity as a religion, you will go to heaven. And all others who don't conform to these rituals and practices, no matter how senseless and stupid, no matter how radically different from what Jesus envisaged, taught and demonstrated in the world, uh, we will all go to heaven 
and those who don't conform to it will go to hell. This kind of rather crude notion, which has nothing to do with what Jesus did and what Jesus demonstrated. So, all religions are crutches. That's why we will never outgrow religion. In fact, one of the great challenges that Jesus presents to everyone is that if religion is really a medium for the growth of human beings, for the empowerment of growth, uh, human beings, they should be able to outgrow religion. For example, if you join a school or a college, and if the college is doing its work, and you're also working as you should, then you will outgrow the year to which you are admitted. Say you're admitted to first year of a degree program. You have to outgrow that and be promoted to the second year. That means that you have done your work. The institution also has done its work. Suppose you join an institution which retains you lifelong in the first year of the degree program, never allows you to progress one inch further. That educational institution is the exact counterpart of organized religion. This is the reason why in organized religion you don't take a step forward, you stay frozen forever, forever. Whereas the spiritual way of life that Jesus envisaged is fundamentally a place of growth. It is an unmistakable invitation to grow, grow even to the stature of Jesus Christ. But to grow into the dimension of being the children of God. But Religion is exactly the opposite of that. It freezes you in the status quo, retains you where you are forever, and every impulse you have, every desire that you have, will be suppressed, will be beaten down in the interest of conformity. And your impulse to grow and to move further ahead will be stigmatized and criminalized as heresy, and you'll be dealt with very severely. And this is how Every organized religion in the world necessarily acquires a regressive and repressive character. Now, in contrast to this, Jesus introduced, Jesus unveiled a vision for humanity which is progressive, which prioritizes the continuous, unending, limitless growth of the human person and the celebration of the joy and the richness thereof as the greatest blessing for the world at large. It is marking this reality and this possibility that Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And in India in particular, light is associated with festivals. We indeed have a festival of light. It's called Diwali. In certain regions of the country, it's pronounced Deepavali. In the north, it is Diwali. In the south, it is Deepavali. But whatever it is, whichever way you pronounce that word, it still means the same, the festival of light. So Jesus would say that your life as a whole needs to be a festival of light. Not that you celebrate a festival of light once a year. Your total life must be a festival of light. You are the light of the world. Now, that is a radically different prospect to what religions of the world, including Christianity, envisage. Nobody becomes the light of the world for being a very faithful member of a church, if anything to the contrary. As a very uh, experienced, honest priest to the Orthodox Church in Kerala told me recently, whatever light there is in a human being will be put out if that person joins a church, any church for that matter. He says, including the Orthodox Church. But if this truth is spoken, people will get very incensed and they'll react with uh, sort of uh, malicious, uh, insane violence. So, clearly this is not what Jesus envisaged. What Jesus envisaged is, uh, is symbolized by the cross. Now, people don't realize that the cross of Jesus Christ is the symbol ultimately of the relentless human pursuit for perfection. Now, here I, have, I must hasten to add that perfection is a divine category. Now, most people, 
when they come to the point where Jesus teaches, as found in the 48th verse of the 5th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus says, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, they pull back, they feel offended, and say, how can any human being be presumptuous enough to assume that he can attain perfection? They think it's great humility to say that no human being should pursue perfection simply for the reason that it's an unattainable goal. But Jesus says God is perfect. Perfection is certainly God's inalienable, indefeasible attribute. But if you become the children of God, then it becomes your duty to seek and attain that perfection. If you refuse to move into that zone of possibility, then what you're saying is true. But your vocation is not to be a better human being in the worldly sense of the term, though that's a, it's better than being a rotten human being, no doubt. But that's not the spiritual aim. The spiritual aim is, to, is not to become slightly better, but to be born again, but to become a new creation. And the hallmark of the new creation is that you become perfect and nothing less than attaining perfection will satisfy you. And therefore, all of your life will be a relentless, unremitting, resolute pursuit after perfection. Now, I worked lifelong in St. Stephen's College, which was founded by five Cambridge missionaries to Delhi. And the very foundation of that institution is the pursuit of perfection. And the founders of the college were very clear that only by pursuing perfection will human beings be able to honor God Therefore, the motto of St. Stephen's College is ad dea gloriam, which in Latin means to the glory of God. How can human beings pursue the glory of God only by pursuing perfection? So, the quintessential goal of spiritual life is not just to slightly improve oneself. It's not just to earn the eligibility to be admitted to, the world, uh, to heaven in the life after death. The most quintessential purpose of spirituality is to attain perfection here and now in this world. And the cross of Jesus Christ denotes the price that needs to be paid for it. Because in this world, as, hit, uh, as history witness, witnesses to us time and again, and as all historians of ideas testify without exception, that whenever and wherever a radically new idea has been introduced in the history of humankind. There has been necessarily a violent and negative, if possible, murderous reaction to that idea. Because human nature is dominated by the principle of inertia. In religious language, by the principle of sloth or laziness. We are like a piece of stone, if you like, if you don't mind. We would rather stay where we are than make an effort to move forward because that very, the, the very prospect of having to make, the, make that effort puts us off. We would rather be where we are, but ideally without having to pay the price for it. But being stationary, being immobile, being stuck in the status quo is actually against the law of nature, is against the law of life. And therefore, this state of being frozen in the status quo invites its own misery. And that misery escalates over time. And therefore, as the German philosopher Martin Heidegger put beautifully, it's not possible to maintain yourself as you are because such a state is not countenanced by the law of nature, the law of life. Religion is basically a program for maintaining the status quo. There's a reason why all religions everywhere in every age of history served as a handmaiden or a servant of the status quo. And all the uh, uh, priorities, preferences and policies the posturing that the custodians of religion adopted from time to time were singularly meant to subserve the interests of the status quo. The status quo, for obvious reasons, has, has only one priority, that is to preserve and perpetuate itself. And therefore, this religious vision has only one goal, and that is 
the maintenance of the present situation as it is. This is what I call religion as maintenance department. Religion as a maintenance project. And the religious, um, the, the, the animators of our religious life as maintenance work, maintenance works department employees. But maintenance is not an option. In the 17th verse of the 5th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, I have come to fulfill them. Now I am sure that Martin Heidegger derived his inspiration or his very profound insight from this teaching of Jesus Christ, which theologians over several centuries did not understand. Actually, it took a rather controversial philosopher like Martin Heidegger to understand the meaning of this teaching, though he does not acknowledge it or connect his very significant insight to the biblical source. But that's up to him. So what does Jesus say and what did Martin Heidegger say, and I believe based on that? Jesus says the quintessential goal in our spiritual life is not the mere maintenance of the establishment of religion or religious establishment, it is the fulfillment of the original divine intention. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets adumbrate or enfold within themselves the will of God as revealed in the past. But human beings were incapable of understanding and implementing the will of God as it was revealed. Therefore, they reduced it to suit their capacity and convenience. And when anything is reduced in that manner, it suffers dispersion and deformation. And thereafter, people will go from one stage of deformation to the next. So it becomes an inward spiral of progressive or es progressing or escalating deformation. So that over a period of time, the original cannot be recognized uh, in connection with what comes into being as the norm. The norm becomes a mockery of what was once the norm or the original state. And this is true of all institutions upon the face of the earth. The general principle is that whatever exists in time becomes over time a contradiction of itself. I repeat, it's a principle worth remembering. Whatever exists in time, that is whatever exists in this world, in time and space. So whatever exists in time becomes, what will happen to them becomes over time, over a period of time, a contradiction of itself. Because of the process that I've just referred to, I don't want to repeat what I have said. Now therefore, the necessary uh, thing to do core duty of being human is not to preserve something as it is, which is simply impossible because if you preserve something as it is in a changing world, ever-changing world uh, of swift and sweeping changes, radical changes, it will become obsolete. If you preserve something as it is, whatever is thus preserved will become obsolete. For example, you go to a museum Everything is preserved, but nothing that is preserved in the museum is relevant to your contemporary life. They are there just for the sake of curiosity and remembrance. They have nothing to do, even if all the museums in the world are destroyed, it's that, that destruction is not going to affect your practical life. But I'm not advocating the destruction or vandalism of museums. Uh, please don't get my meaning wrong. What I'm saying is that this maintenance approach is a terrible the service to hu the human condition. Now, uh, for a moment, let's concentrate on, or let's reckon what Martin Heidegger said. Martin said, or if you like, uh, philosopher Heidegger said, that it's impossible to preserve anything as it is. And therefore, if you have any sense of history and the dynamics of time, you should talk not about preservation, but enhancement preservation. Please understand this. For young people, this is extremely valuable to remember this. Nothing can be preserved as it is. 
the only way to preserve, if at all there is a healthy or sensible way of preserving anything, it has to be enhancement preservation. That is to say, you can preserve something only by continually enhancing it. Of course, this doesn't, this doesn't, apply, this doesn't apply to the contents of a museum, where the items on display cannot be enhanced. They can only be preserved as it is, like a piece of dry bone, if you like. But anything living can be preserved and has to be preserved by enhancing it. I think that's a very valuable insight. Now, the interesting thing to recognize is that the cross of Jesus Christ is the price paid for this enhancement maintenance. That's why Jesus taught that we should deem, we should regard and accept the pursuit of perfection as the quintessential spiritual discipline of our life. Our present state does no justice to who we really are or who we really ought to be, ought to be. The early book of the Bible, the book of Genesis in particular, is full of insights regarding what we were meant to be. What we ought to be is a direct consequence of what we were envisaged to be, which is a creational intent and therefore by giving us a kind of mythopoetic account of creation, particularly the creation of human beings, we are given a poetic idea, not a scientific description, a factual account of what we ought to be. Uh, and uh, therefore, the essential discipline that we ought to maintain is realizing, recognizing that pursuit of excellence as human beings in respect of all aspects of our personality, body, mind and soul, according to the higher standards as exemplified in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. That comprises the most exciting and, exciting and exhilarating vocation of being a believer. By being a nominal Christian, we are nowhere near the mark. I have to say there is a sheer waste of time. It is as good as not having any religion at all. It is de facto atheism, though it may not seem to you to, seem to, you to be so. In fact, it is because whatever contradicts the will of God, whatever stands as an obstacle in the path of fulfilling God's purposes and plans concerning humanity as a whole, cannot be spiritually valid. It has to be rendered invalid. It is invalid. In fact, this is the realization that underlies the spiritual vision and ministry of Jesus Christ when he said, as found in the 18th verse of the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel, that he came to set the captives free. Jesus was not referring to political captivity. He was referring to this condition of captivity to the status quo in which people stay stagnant, in a state of peculiar rigor mortis, existential rigor mortis, where they cannot move one inch forward. They are frozen, they are fixed, they are formulated. And the animators of religion will sustain the illusion that by repeating certain rites, rituals and practices, all your needs for the present and for eternity are met. This is a sheer illusion. There is not an iota of truth in this. Who recognized this? Jesus recognized it. And I am clear about it only because Jesus recognized it. And it is because Jesus recognized this that Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, which means that nowhere in the world as it is today, Worship in spirit and truth is offered. The worship that's meant singularly to preserve everything in the status quo, preserve the status quo as it is, is not worship. It's something disguised as worship. It act, does serious disservice to human beings because it entraps them and anchors them, it imprisons them in this world of delusion that by repeating the, a certain set of things mechanically, the core religious, the core spiritual purpose, the core spiritual mission is attempted and accomplished, uh, which is simply not the case, which is simply not the case. Therefore, please, for God's sake, understand that Christianity is not a religion of the crutch. 
it is a, the religion of the cross. And the cross is the most heroic and exhilarating invitation to wake up from our sleep and to go forward, to march relentlessly, relentlessly to the final destination, which is being one with God. It, which, it is that state that Jesus exemplified. Therefore, in all honesty, Jesus could say, I and my Father are one. Attaining that blissful state is the purpose of our spirituality. And you will readily agree that in order to attain that state, we have to go a long, long, long way. And it's indeed a long way. And that way is Jesus Christ. Hence it is that Jesus said with tremendous confidence and clarity. Uh, the sixth verse of the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The cross is the way of life. And life, unlike death, demands the pursuit of perfection until the very last breath of your life. That, and nothing less than that, is the spiritual goal. So said Jesus of Nazareth. I believe that it is so. What about you? What about you? God bless you.